In the Kuban region of the USSR, on the shore of the Azov Sea, 40 kilometers from the city of Yeysk, there is a small fishing village located around a group of grain elevators. It is called Paraprava. My husband soon began receiving wages and rations. I began teaching reading and writing to the village children. Paraprava did not have schools, and even half of the adults were illiterate. Since I did this for free, the students would sometimes bring me fresh fish or a pitcher of milk as payment. We decided to visit my mother-in-law's in Yeysk. As a present, we brought along several of our turkeys. At night, they would sleep in the fruit trees in the yard, while those that needed more room would fly over the fence, walk across the square, and perch themselves on the cornices of what was then still the Staropokrovsky Church. There was still plenty of bread in the city, and although there was a city bakery, that is not where people bought their bread. Most of the bread was made by the housewives themselves. This wonderful bread was baked from the finest flour, fragrant with a pinkish crust. The authorities began a food rationing program. They distributed ration cards, and soon the people began forming lines for bread. The famine had not yet begun, and the factories and plants were still working. Workers continued to receive their wages, some buying bread on the black market at three times the regular price. As yet, no one we knew was dying from hunger. The city was beginning to experience unemployment. Since my husband was unable to find work, we decided to move on to Mariupol. My husband found a job, as well as food rations, of one kilo of bread per day for himself, 400 grams for the children, and 200 grams for me. We were now receiving almost an entire loaf of bread, although half-baked and heavy as a rock. Since there was no other food, it was usually consumed in one sitting. When the ration cards needed to be changed, there was no food for several days. The marketplace had become almost empty of goods. A dirty piece of lard costs a ruble here. So does a medium-sized potato, and there is no cabbage. How can a Russian survive without borscht? Then an official arrived from Moscow and made some kind of foggy speech about Germany's intentions for expansion. We ridiculed the speech, saying... Let the Germans jabber away. But it seemed that something was going on in the upper political circles. But because we had grown accustomed to slogans such as be on guard and the enemy is at the gates, we did not take the speeches very seriously. Most of us just waited for the obligatory lectures to end so that we could go home. Then the announcement was made to the entire civilian population that because of strategic considerations and the experience in other cities, we had to begin digging anti-tank trenches at a distance of a rifle shot from the city. To execute this order, the entire populace, regardless of age and sex, was needed, anyone capable of holding a shovel. The city was soon surrounded by the Germans, beginning with a small contingent of motorcycle units that set up their machine guns on the hill, they continued to arrive by tanks and to clear the town of all retreating Red Army soldiers. This did not take very long, and soon things calmed down. The Germans then began to take up quarters in the city itself. Up to now, the Jews had been left alone and walked about freely, although the authorities were keeping track of them. On a certain day, old man Gorlin, who had been a neighbor, came knocking on my door and informed us that the Germans had ordered the Jews to pack up their belongings and prepare to leave. It was difficult to believe that they would shoot down seven and a half thousand people for no reason, but several days later they were executed and buried in those same trenches that we had dug around the city 
before the Germans arrived. A vile, inhuman, and criminal act had taken place in history. Several people died in our building, the Jews had been killed, and the yard became empty. My children and I were sent to Germany. At the Mariupol station, we said goodbye to everything that had been dear to us, and we said goodbye forever. The railway car was filled to the limit, and the doors were bolted shut with a padlock. One of the men in the prison with us was a German soldier, a deserter. He said that half of Germany was already in American hands. We listened in amazement, not believing our ears, but saying nothing. We did not want to miss a single word of his account. Throughout our entire four-year imprisonment, we had not known what was happening on the military front. We stood for hours in the hallways with the other prisoners, talking without being told to return to our cells.